Economics and economic policy can help to build peace, but economic analysis and economic policy can also inadvertently fuel the flames of war. There's a strong case for reorienting economics in order to accept investment in peace as an important and in many cases overriding objective, particularly in war-torn societies that are emerging from a protracted civil conflict. In reorienting economic policy towards investing in peace, there are at least four significant obstacles that we encounter. First, the competing objectives of policymakers. In principle, peace may be the main objective. This is often the one that's held up by the policymakers involved. But in practice, other things often can and do intervene. Among these are what are broadly called geopolitical uh, interests. For example, during the Cold War, the blind eye that was turned by the US government towards the abuses of power of Mobutu in Zaire, now the Democratic Republic of Congo, or in Nicaragua under the Somoza regime, or in the Philippines under the Marcos regime, or in Chile under the Pinochet regime. These abuses of power that ultimately were far from uh, compatible with the goal of building a durable and lasting peace or the goal of promoting the broad-based prosperity of the population at large. These abuses were tolerated in the name of the Cold War. That was a geopolitical objective. In Rwanda, for example, in the early 90s, not long after the end of the Cold War, one factor that was at play was rivalry between the French on the one side and the British and Americans on the other over whether the future of the country would be Francophone or Anglophone. It seems like a petty consideration compared to mass slaughter, but it was something that was there. A second objective, and often the single most important one in the actual implementation of external assistance programs, is a set of economic and commercial interests, competition for contracts, competition for access to resources. Who actually gets the money? Often, the representatives of the inter so-called international community, including ambassadors in post-conflict settings, see as one of their main jobs to make sure that firms from their country get the contracts for various activities, be it reconstruction or providing services like, for example, maintaining the national airlines that local staff are at that point unable to provide. Those objectives militate against the kinds of policies I've been describing. They militate against pressing leaders to do difficult but necessary things to consolidate the peace. They militate against conditionalities of any sort that might interfere with getting the contract. And the leaders who have private interests that they wish to pursue within these uh, countries are often quite adept at playing the donors and the diplomats off against each other. So overcoming that pressure to put doing business ahead of doing the right thing is another big obstacle. And finally, another example of a priority which can interfere with building peace is refugee repatriation. So to give you an example, during the war in uh, the former Yugoslavia, upwards of 300,000 Bosnians wound up in Germany as refugees. And the German government did a reasonable job in relative terms of supporting those refugees. But once the Dayton Peace Accords were signed, the German government wanted to get these people back to Bosnia as many and as fast as they could. Now, getting the refugees back to Bosnia is not quite the same thing as getting them back to where they came from, from communities where they had been driven out by the other side. 
During the Bosnian War, there was kind of an ethnic omelet that was unscrambled as one side or another side took control in a particular area and drove the others out. And so for people to come back to their homes often would mean coming back to apartments, communities from which they had been forcibly dispossessed and in places where their properties, the places they lived, the businesses they owned had been effectively expropriated by usurpers who had come in from the other side and taken control of these things as some of the spoils of war. Dealing with that problem in the way, for example, that the United Nations High Commission for Refugees attempted to do in its Open Cities program would slow down the process of refugee repatriation. It would mean that you're not just going to send people back on the next plane. You've got to wait for certain conditions to be met and put in place to enable them to return to their homes not only return to their homes, but return to some sort of a future in those places in terms of employment, in terms of access to public services, schools for their kids, and so on. And so rather than waiting for those conditions, very often there was an impetus to put the refugees on the first train or plane back. And so where would they end up if they couldn't go back to their homes? Well, they'd end up in other people's homes. They'd end up in homes that had previously been occupied by other people who themselves had been displaced. But these were places in which the ethnic group to which they were assumed to belong was in control, where they could go back. And what that in turn meant was that it would make it even harder for refugees and internally displaced people from that community to come back to their homes because now they were occupied by somebody else. So that's a competing priority, right? This whole issue of, um, of partition is not just one in terms of the architecture of peace accords, it's also one in terms of the implementation of assistance in a post-conflict setting. And aid that reinforces de facto partitions among people of the type I've described rather than pushing for reconciliation and reintegration can be part of the problem in the long term rather than part of the solution. So these competing objectives, geopolitical, commercial interests, refugee repatriation, whatever, can get in the way of the kind of patient and difficult tasks of orienting economic policy towards building a durable peace. The performance of the people administering loans and executing projects is judged often above all by how successful they are at getting the project approved and then getting the money out the door. If you're going to be judged on the basis of whether you manage to complete the project and build so many miles of highway or turn the lights back on, restore the electric system, or build so many school buildings, whether you got that money out the door and wound up the project on schedule, that militates against the kind of careful calibration of the delivery of external assistance, of the delivery of incentives and carrots to fulfillment of obligations and commitments under the peace process. It militates against any form of conditionality, including peace conditionality, that would potentially slow down or even block the delivery of that assistance. And so the objectives that judge a person's performance, the performance of a loan officer, of a project manager, simply on the basis of whether they spent the money and not on the basis of what was accomplished, what effects those disbursements had, is part of the problem. It's part of the obstacles to the kind of reorientation I'm talking about. We need to evaluate outcomes on the basis, among other things, of their contribution to building a durable peace and not solely on whether we were able to wrap up that loan on schedule. Another obstacle consists of the ideological biases that are brought to bear by the people involved in making economic policies. And two examples I want to cite that have come up before that are particularly salient here. One is 
the focus on so-called efficiency above all. Efficiency, as those of you who are trained in economics will know, has a rather specific definition uh, in economic analysis. It's not just about cost effectiveness. It's not just about deciding, oh, what's the most cost effective way for me to go from here to there, from point A to point B. It's also about deciding whether I should go from point A to point B at all. It's also about evaluating ends as well as deciding upon the means to achieve those ends. And while cost effectiveness, the most cost effective means to achieve ends, is a relatively non-controversial goal, efficiency in that broader sense of deciding ends by weighing up costs and benefits is a far more contentious procedure, even though many economists pretend or act as if it's not. Because to do so, you've got to reduce all of the consequences of your actions or inactions to a single metric, dollars and cents, and add them up, and that involves discounting future costs and benefits to convert them into present values. It involves using shadow prices to put upon so-called externalities, things that don't have market uh, value in many cases, um, like, for example, peace. So the focus on efficiency, so-called efficiency, completely neglects distributional issues like who gets the money and who bears the costs? And what's the balance between those parties and within those parties? The questions of which groups in terms of horizontal equity or in terms of rich and poor are on the receiving end of benefits and on the receiving end of net costs, those become absolutely critical questions in the context of building a durable peace, and yet they're completely swept under the rug by the efficiency uh, criterion. A second ideological bias that we've encountered, and I want to mention it briefly again, is the visceral doctrinal antipathy to tariffs as a mechanism of raising revenue and of protecting domestic producers. This is part of the so-called Washington Consensus, sometimes called neoliberalism, that emerged uh, starting in the late 70s and becoming consolidated during the Reagan and Thatcher years of the 1980s, and that continued to dominate policymaking in the Bretton Woods institutions and among other donor agencies well into the 90s, and continues to exert a grip on the thinking of economists and policymakers today. Tariffs can and should be an important source of revenue, particularly for countries that have low tax coefficients, that is to say a low ratio of total government revenue to national income, and that have weak development of institutions for collecting taxes in other ways, for example, through taxes on income or property or consumption. Because tariffs are a relatively easy thing to collect. You collect them at the point where the goods are entering the country. Not only is this an important way to get revenue, which is desperately needed in order to build new in democratic institutions and in order to fulfill commitments under peace accords and in order to relieve human suffering. But also, tariffs are a way that you can potentially protect some of your most vulnerable economic sectors. So here I'm thinking of tariffs not only or even primarily as a way to protect industrial producers, which is the conventional way that they were advocated in import substitution industrialization strategies for development in the 50s and 60s, but more as a way to protect some of the most vulnerable producers in the society, including small farmers. Let me give you an example. In the wake of the war in El Salvador, a lot of foreign exchange came into the country through external assistance and to some extent repatriation of money earned by Salvadoreños abroad. And that influx of foreign exchange helps to appreciate the local currency, making imports more competitive, as well as making exports less competitive. Tariffs are a way to head off that competition 
from imports that are cheaper by virtue of exchange rate appreciation, or perhaps, as in the case of international food markets, by virtue of the subsidies that are received by agricultural producers in countries like the United States uh, and in much of Europe. So you have this artificially cheap food, including corn, for example, one of the major staple crops in Central America, that is available on the international market. And local producers find it very difficult to compete against an influx of cheap imports. Well, in that case, tariffs are potentially a way in which you can protect local producers as well from the effect of that influx of um, external goods that are financed in part by foreign aid and in part by exchange rate appreciation. Now, in the case of food, that's not an easy uh, one to do, an easy trade-off to make, because food is, of course, also an important staple for the population. So one has to, again, engage in a balancing act between the interests of farmers who are net sellers of maize, let's say, versus consumers who are net buyers of maize. But it's an issue that economists ought to be open to thinking about, rather than just across the board, assuming that tariffs are always a bad thing, always inefficient in all circumstances. Another obstacle that sometimes comes up is national sovereignty. Governments, political leaders, leaders of warring parties or erstwhile warring parties often react, as one might expect, negatively to the imposition of any kinds of conditions on assistance or access to external resources, especially conditions that would have the effect of making them do things or incentivizing them to do things that they would otherwise not choose to do. And those are the only real kind of conditions that matter because if they didn't need to be incentivized, they would do them anyway. Aid itself with or without conditions is an intervention. That's the first important point to recognize. So if one's talking about national sovereignty, as soon as one is talking about external assistance coming into a country, particularly if it's coming in on a big scale relative to the size of the local economy, that is an intervention. That alters balances of power within the country. It has economic effects, both at the micro level, in terms of who gets what, and at the macro level, in terms of prices and inflation and exchange rates. And so that intervention by itself is an infringement, so to speak, on national sovereignty. And yet governments accept those interventions. They just, well, don't want the conditions that come with that assistance. But the call that resistance to conditions, a defense of national sovereignty, is to miss the fact that the sovereignty has already been compromised by the fact that these external resources are coming in and altering the balance of political power as well as the functioning of the economy. A second important point here is that nations are not unitary actors. Diluting the sovereignty of some may strengthen the sovereignty of others. And this is particularly evident in the case of conflict-torn, war-torn societies, societies embarked on tenuous post-conflict transitions. Weakening the sovereignty of people who would be inclined to abuse external resources and potentially reignite conflict can be a good thing in terms of the sovereignty of many other people in the same country. So the national sovereignty tends to collapse that diversity of interests into a single uh, metric which is identified with the sovereignty of the ruler rather than the sovereignty of the people. And finally, of course, national sovereignty is itself a means, not an end. It's a means to the advancement of human well-being and self-determination and freedom. It's not the end in itself. And when individual sovereignty and human well-being are the ends, that may sometimes require compromises in terms of uh, national sovereignty. So for all of these reasons, I think it is um, possible 
and indeed necessary to reorient economic policy towards the goal of peace building. But it's, again, not an easy task. Not easy at all. There are dilemmas which we've discussed. There are these obstacles which we've discussed. If I stop at the end to reflect back on the more than 30 years that I've been working on this topic, a substantial amount of progress has in fact been made. When I began working on these issues, it wasn't widely regarded as a problem in the economics profession if countries were unequal and growing more unequal in the distribution of income, wealth, or power. Today, inequality is more likely to be seen as a problem than something to be tolerated or even welcomed as it was back then. Similarly, as a result of hard lessons learned by experience, many aid agencies, notably some of the bilateral donor agencies, embrace the notion of what's called conflict sensitivity analysis or conflict impact assessment as part of their decision-making process. So in weighing up whether and when and how and to whom to give resources with what conditions attached, they would not only be looking at the traditional considerations that go into a cost-benefit analysis, but they would also be looking at the potential impacts of their decisions on the likelihood of perpetuation or resumption of violent conflict. In a similar way, starting in a halting fashion in the 1970s and then progressing since that time, environmental impact assessment became part of, if not standard operating procedure, at least a widespread part of the decision-making process in deciding what forms of development assistance to provide. More broadly, I would say that in the economics profession over my career over these years, there's been the growth of more and more questioning of received conventional wisdoms, efficiency at the micro level and growth at the macro level, sometimes called the size of the economic pie, is not the only consideration that economists should be taking into account in recommending policies and making decisions. On the contrary, it is only one consideration among many, and another very important consideration is how our economic policies will impact on the likelihood of violent conflict and on the likelihood of building peaceful societies. Thank you.